Chaos and panic across Afghanistan as two decades of U.S. and NATO intervention unravel within weeks. As the Taliban takes the capital Kabul, Washington defends its decision to pull U.S. troops out. So how will Afghanistan under a new Taliban government take shape? And will promises of peace and protection be realized? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. A two-decade-long effort by the United States and its NATO allies to establish strong democratic institutions and functioning security forces in Afghanistan came to a shocking end on Sunday. Just one week ago, U.S. intelligence predicted it would take three months before the Taliban seized Kabul. As the last major city was taken, a spokesman for the group declared the war is over. Not long after President Ashraf Ghani assured the Afghan people he would do his best to keep the capital safe, he fled the country, reportedly to Uzbekistan, in order to avoid bloodshed. Now, just hours later, Taliban forces took control of the presidential palace. As the capital fell, helicopters evacuated personnel from the U.S. Embassy. There were long lines outside banks and scenes of desperation at Kabul airport as people stormed the tarmac, hoping to escape. Now, despite 20 years and billions of dollars spent to train and support Afghan security forces, Taliban fighters swept up the last remaining government-held territories in a swift, week-long offensive. Taliban deputy leader Mullah Bararar says the group's plans for governing will soon become clear, but they will guarantee the safety of all citizens and officials. We congratulate the great victory to the whole Afghan nation, especially to the people of Kabul and to our mujahideens. The way we have come through was unexpected as we have reached the position which was never expected. But with the help of Allah, that he has given us the victory and there is nothing like this in history of the world, so we should thank Allah. We should have no arrogance. Now is the time to trial. We will give services to our nation. We give serenity to the whole nation that we will go as far as possible for the betterment of their lives. Let's cross to Kabul now, where I am joined by Mohammed Daoud Sultan Zoy, who was appointed the mayor of Kabul by Ashraf Ghani in April last year. He is still serving as mayor of Kabul, and he is also a former presidential advisor and candidate. Thank you so much for being with us. I first want to get your perspective, your story, really, on how this happened this fast. Where were Afghan security forces? Where was the Afghan military? Where was your government? Uh, well, thank you. Let me clarify one thing. Uh, I was not appointed as mayor of Kabul as a charity by Mr. Ghani. I was a rival candidate, and then I played a political role in the country, and that's uh, why I became the mayor of Kabul, naturally uh, under his uh, presidency. Uh, to question, uh, the question, uh, I think, uh, should be asked from all players that how did this uh, get to this place and how did we uh, end up uh, with such a unparalleled uh, situation, uh, the lightning speed at, with, with which the Taliban uh, swept through the country uh, and the military collapse of uh, every province, including Kabul. Uh, naturally, as a democratic uh, country, the military was under civilian rule uh, and under civilian management. And I think the answer should be found at the top of uh, civilian echelon of the governance of the country. Uh, the military uh, was, uh, uh, was, was not led properly by a civilian uh, administration. Uh, one reason was, uh, was ex exactly that. But there are many other factors, of course, uh, that played a role that uh, requires a lengthy discussion that your program may not allow that. Uh, but uh, we will suffice to say that uh, uh, leadership failure was the main cause. Okay. And that is, that is widely understood, that there was a serious failure in governance in Afghanistan, not just recently, but over the many years that uh, foreign troops were stationed there. Uh, corruption was rife. Still, however, the Taliban is now where it is. You have decided to stay. Um, I need to ask you why you feel safe staying in Kabul. Meanwhile, Ashraf Ghani, the president himself, decided to flee. 
Well, I will never flee my country, especially in a historic uh, moment where the country needs everybody to stay and defend the values that this country has to stand for and uh, serve the country that we've uh, been born in. Uh, as human beings, we owe it to our societies uh, globally and, of course, within the national boundaries of uh, each country that we have lived in to fulfill our duties and not run away and not shy away from responsibilities and cave in to, uh, to bumps on the road. So are you angry at Ashraf Ghani then for running out of the country? I think the, hi the history will judge. Uh, you know, history uh, uh, either puts people on the path that they will uh, take advantage of or they will uh, plunder that opportunity. So. Uh, uh, the opportunity uh, uh, has always been there. History uh, doesn't have any prejudice. It allows people to play their role. And if they fail to play it, then they have to answer for it. Okay. I also need to understand exactly your position then, because you have said that the Taliban act actually contacted you and effectively asked you to continue serving as mayor. Uh, why, why did they feel comfortable with your leadership continuing uh, in Kabul, even regardless of your close association with Ashraf Ghani's government, who they have endless disdain for? I was the mayor of Kabul. Uh, Mr. Ghani was the president, and I dealt with him uh, on official basis. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't uh, any of uh, his close associates. Uh, he had very few. Uh, but the reason the Taliban approached me was uh, he, they saw what I did in Kabul in the past year and uh, 14 months or so. I have been uh, very uh, uh, straightforward, uh, very transparent. I've been disciplined and I've uh, um, made sure that the governance is paid attention to. A country that is, ha is at war doesn't mean that everything should be dealt with from a war perspective. We need to um, allow governance rule of law and services and that is what governance is and therefore i played my role and i'm still playing my role and i'll do it until uh, i'm asked uh, to step aside this is my country even if i don't have an official position i'll still serve this country at any capacity but right now i think uh, the emphasis should be on governance rule of law and services and we should forget the uh, turn the military page to a civilian page and a civilian governance that will provide services to the people and uh, uh, harbor their uh, uh, trust and confidence. Okay. I mean, do you expect then to be asked to step aside soon, even though you believe that there should be civilian governance? Do you envision some sort of election taking place? How do you see the transition happening to Taliban rule? I don't perform my duties based on expectations from others. I uh, fulfill my responsibilities based on expectations uh, from the, uh, that society has from me and that I have my, from myself. And if they don't uh, feel satisfied, then that's their prerogative. Uh, but uh, 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 what I see in the future, I think the few uh, days and weeks will be very uh, confusing turbulent in political sense, uh, like many other uh, months and years that we had uh, behind us. And in this turbulence, the international community, our neighbors, and our own society has, uh, they have their role to play and they have their responsibilities. Uh, some of these responsibilities were not fulfilled adequately by any of the sides that I mentioned, but we still have time now to fix some of those uh, problems and learn from the mistakes and move on. We cannot dwell on the past too long because otherwise we will lose future opportunities. Right. So you envision confusing days and weeks to come. What about post that? What do you really see as the future for your country now and its governance? The future of the country, again, uh, should be decided by the majority of the people, not by the few monopolies that have been in power for the past 20 years who have caused mayhem and problem in this country. I think uh, the people of this country are fed up with the repeated faces, with the repeated uh, promises, and with the repeated uh, struggle and power struggle and corruption, and also uh, the revolving door of uh, uh, you're in and you're out, and the same people turn around and come back. I think we are uh, we are uh, here waiting for a political outbreak uh, and, and and breakthrough, I should say. 
uh, and also the fulfillment of responsibilities of the society to assemble, be besieged and, and come together and uh, have a voice that uh, is reasonable and is a future forward looking voice. You know, it's hard, very hard to see the scenes that we've been seeing out of Kabul, I mean, particularly at the airport, and hundreds of people just desperate to escape. Still, though, you seem to have some sort of hope or, or vision for the future of Afghanistan. Are you optimistic? I am optimistic, otherwise I won't be here. Every Afghan that wants to play a role for the future of this country has to be optimistic to move forward. Uh, it's only optimism that gives you that energy. Pessimism will not get us anywhere at this point. And it's tragic that uh, a lot of uh, uh, hype and a lot of uh, uncertainty created uh, what was happening yesterday at the airport. And I think it should have been managed uh, more professionally and more humanely. Uh, and I think uh, the chaos uh, sometimes is expected in these situations. It was a lightning change. It was an unexpected, uh, fast-moving change, and therefore the panic that uh, set in on the society as a whole and on some people particularly created a very unwelcome situation, and I, I hope we can avoid that from happening again. Okay. Mohammed Dawood Sultan Zoy, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us there from Kabul. We greatly appreciate it. So with the Taliban takeover more or less complete, they now have to govern effectively. Now, they've promised to maintain security, end corruption, and protect women, minorities, and even foreigners. But can they be believed? To discuss that, I'm joined now from New York by David Sedney. He was the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan during the Obama administration. Imtiaz Ghul joins us from Islamabad. He's an author and the founder of the Center for Research and Security Studies. And from Melbourne is Shahrom Akbarzadeh, a research professor of Middle East and Central Asian politics at Deakin University. Thanks all so much for being with us. First, I want to look at exactly what was negotiated uh, over the course of, of the so-called peace talks that actually helped pave the way uh, for this return of the Taliban that we're seeing now. There were supposed to be elections. There was supposed to be some sort of power sharing negotiated at some point, certain guarantees uh, that would protect women and minorities. All we seem to have now uh, is the Taliban's word with no collateral to back it up, no one on the ground to monitor or enforce any protections, and we also have to remember that tens of thousands of hardened fighters have now been released from prison and have resumed the fight. David Sedney, I'll start with you. Is this the worst case scenario unfolding here? Almost. There can always be worse, but this is about as bad as it gets. As you said, the so-called peace, peace talks were nothing. They were always a sham. They were a tactic by the Taliban to, to facilitate their ascension to power. After the Taliban in the United States signed the, what I call the surrender accords in February 2020, the Taliban went out onto the streets of Doha, did victory dances, burned American flags, and said they had beaten the United States. That message that the Taliban had beaten the United States was a cornerstone of their propaganda that helped them come to power. And when President Biden said that he would withdraw and had no regrets, that was the death knell for the Afghan government and administration. The United States tragically, sadly, uh, horribly abandoned uh, all those who had supported and worked with it. And this is something, a day that will live in infamy for the United States of America. Uh, let me ask you this, David, quickly. I mean, as for President Vi Biden, he remembers clearly, you know, pushing to pull out of Vietnam, actually, uh, no matter how bad the optics were at the time. And years later, I think he felt he was vindicated. Do you think he's expecting the same now uh, with the Taliban? I think he was expecting a long fight. He did not realize the power of his own words. He doesn't know how to be president yet. So when he made the decision to pull out, and particularly last week when he said he had no regrets, he didn't realize the power the U.S. had. Just a few thousand troops kept the Taliban at bay. As soon as those few thousand troops were removed, the Taliban swept the power and an entire nation fell. Mm. So he did not know how to use the power he had. And uh, now he is seeing a horrible mess. And what is happening 
in Washington is even is in many ways even worse because American officials are now saying uh, that are now blaming Afghans. Uh, they should not be blaming Afghans. They should be blaming themselves. Interesting. Okay. MTLs, let me turn to you. You believe the Taliban has actually changed, that uh, you've said they're more politically mature. Uh, but I question how much the Taliban leaders who vouch uh, for that maturity, most of them are, are in Doha. And I'm wondering how much they, they actually match the, the sentiments of the fighters that are on the ground, where they're they're still hanging people from bridges as punishment for crimes and in plain view of children. Uh, they're saying they will avenge the deaths of their brothers, uh, that girls will not go to school, and that they will continue to fight or kill wherever necessary to ensure their interpretation of Sharia law. Um, are there two Talibans at play here? I believe we lost Imtiaz. Uh, let me turn to Shahom. Sure, thanks for that. I don't think that the Taliban have changed fundamentally. They are saying, they're sending all the right signals. They are trying to, um, especially when they were fighting in Doha, they were um, making all the right noises because they knew they were talking to an international audience. But this was, uh, doesn't, is not really reflected in what's happening in Afghanistan on the ground. Uh, there have been reports of Taliban sending uh, female um, um, you know, workers from bank in bank branches home because women are not allowed to work outside the home. Um, um, there are reports that in Herat they are knocking on doors trying to identify people who have worked for government or with security agencies. Uh, they, there are so many worrying signs that uh, does uh, it doesn't really bode well. Mm -hmm. Sure, there hasn't been major bloodshed in the street. Uh, which is, uh, I guess, we need to be thankful of, uh, thankful for. But um, fundamentally, uh, I have not seen any major change in the Taliban. Okay. Uh, very unfortunately, we have lost uh, Imtiaz Gul. Uh, we're going to try to get back to him as soon as possible because I'd like to hear his opinion on that. He seems to have some confidence uh, in Taliban leadership going forward. Uh, but David, if I could come back to you. Um, you sound diplomatically angry uh, right now at the Biden administration for what's happened here. Tell me a little bit more about why, especially looking toward the future. I mean, the reason the United States went into Afghanistan was to protect U.S. interests um, and to stop the multiplication of, of terrorist groups that had found safe haven there. Do you think now, uh, with the Taliban in control, there is a serious risk of the very terrorist groups that are most feared finding that same safe haven, even though the Taliban has promised, for whatever that's worth, that they will not work with other terrorist groups? It is a virtual certainty that that will happen. Uh, the Al-Qaeda and Taliban never broke ties. The Taliban refused to break ties with Al-Qaeda. And uh, mm -hmm. throughout Afghanistan, far, as Taliban come into the cities, foreign fighters are coming with them. In Badakhshan, where the Taliban took over several weeks ago, hundreds of foreign fighters are there fighters from China, fighters from Tajikistan, fighters from Uzbekistan. Taliban leaders have been quoted as saying, uh, Afghanistan is only the first step. <clears throat> they want to bring the jihad to the rest of Asia and, and beyond that to the world as well. So what the, what the Biden administration has now on its hands is an Afghanistan that will become a center for activities against the United States, against its allies, and a destabilizing force around the world. Okay, so then what happens? I mean, will the United States just essentially have to wait to be attacked again, and then what, overthrow the Taliban as they did in 2001? The history is unfortunately clear. When the United States abandoned Afghanistan in 1989, after we spent, sent guns and money uh, to the Mujahideen forces, Afghanistan devolved into a civil war, into a hotbed of terrorist plotting that led to the attack on the World Trade Center. The United States was warned repeatedly by Afghans and by others that what was happening, but the United States ignored and the rest of the world ignored what was happening. Uh, then the United States had to go back in in, in in 2001. But when we went in, we said we are not doing nation building. We said we are only here in order to kill people. Uh, we did that. We did a little bit of help to the Afghans. Most of the billions of dollars people talked about didn't go to Afghans. It went to U.S. contractors uh, who were paid huge salaries, wrote long reports, and left. 
Uh, so there was never a serious effort at building an Afghan society. Okay. Uh, and now we are reaping the benefits. We are reaping the reward of that. Thing. Right. Shadholm, let me ask you this. Is there any chance uh, that the Taliban, given the question I asked you initially, uh, the fact that there could be two Talibans at play here, the ones that have been sitting in Doha uh, taking part in the sham of a peace process, as, as David called it, uh, versus those that are still on the ground and really have had no exposure to anything outside of Afghanistan, is there a chance that the Taliban could, in effect, splinter, uh, break away between the fighters on the ground uh, versus the, the leadership uh, that has seen what's outside and perhaps took inspiration from the Gulf states they've been living in that are still conservative yet progressive at the same time? Well, I'm not sure if progressive is the right word when we're talking about the Taliban. No, I'm talking um, about the Gulf states. If they take inspiration yeah, from the Gulf states they've been living in, they see progress there, modernization, but still conservative politics. Yeah. The, the Taliban is made up of many different factions. It's not one unified force. So mm -hmm. there is already a lot of splinters between the Taliban movement. Um, whether or not uh, some of those perhaps uh, enlightened voices who are based in Doha might be able to uh, influence the um, process uh, and uh, you know what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan or whether they can form a different uh, faction really that is um, I think that's more probably wishful thinking I don't really expect that um, those uh, individuals who are uh, residing in Doha would have that level of influence to change the whole way of thinking and the ideological foundation of the Taliban, which is a very strict uh, Islamist movement bent on imposing its Sharia law, bent on imposing its own interpretation of Sharia law on Afghan society. So uh, I, I'm not really optimistic in that uh, regard. Okay. Uh, David, let's look at um, international recognition uh, and whether it is merited, if, if I can put it that way. So far, it seems um, the Taliban has China's tacit support. They're not evacuating any of their staff, and they say that operations will continue as normal. Um, they say they're prepared for, quote-unquote, friendly relations, uh, and that they will judge going forward based on the Taliban's conduct. How much, tell me, is that basic kind of level of trust a boost uh, for the Taliban's legitimacy, and, and is that dangerous? Well, first of all, let me talk about Pakistan. The Pakistan Prime Minister has already welcomed the arrival of the Taliban. If you look at Pakistani social media, the victory of the Taliban is being welcomed as a victory for Pakistan over the United States. So Pakistan will move immediately to support the Taliban. China will, of course, follow Pakistan, as it will, will always do. The Russians have worked to build relationships with the Taliban. We're sending them weapons. So they will work together. So those countries who feel that weakening the United States, weakening the West, weakening uh, uh, the forces that have supported the change in Afghanistan, they will align with the Taliban. Unfortunately, uh, they will find that the Taliban that they support in the end will support forces that oppose them. So the Uyghurs in, in China will find support in, from the Taliban. Uh, those Islamic radicals in uh, in Russia who want to destroy the Russian government will find support in the Taliban, and the Pakistani Taliban will find support in the Taliban. So these countries will all reach out to the Taliban, but it's a poison pill they are, they are taking. Okay, Shavrom, very quickly, your final thoughts then, uh, especially on whatever international recognition there has been and might be for the Taliban going forward. Well, I think uh, China has a very important role to play in uh, in Afghanistan. China has already indicated that they would uh, be working with uh, a Taliban-led government. China is really concerned about stability. It's trying to invest in, in its own uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is connecting China with European markets. Uh, and they've the old Silk Route. So uh, China would be open to acknowledging and recognizing Taliban as legitimate rulers of Afghanistan, especially if in return they can get um, the Taliban's um, agreement not to interfere in the internal affairs of China, 
uh, i.e. in relation to the Uyghur uh, population in Xinjiang. Okay, Shahrom Akbarzadeh, I will give you the last word. Um, unfortunately, our, our third panelist couldn't make it back with connection issues, but I'd really like to thank both of you so much for being with us. Still very, very insightful. Um, and thanks, of course, to our viewers for being with us as well. Uh, I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.